All right, Bismillah. Good afternoon. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Forgive the slight delay. I'm going to hand over straight away to uh, Ian Francis, our vice principal, and we'd like to talk to you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here with you this afternoon. I'd like to thank Kai and Ellis for organising this event on behalf of the college and for inviting me just to say a few words. And when I say a few words, I promise you it will just be a few words, because I know there's a lot to get through this evening. I'd also like to welcome our guests to the college, Dr. and I'm going to read this because I'm terrified of getting it wrong, uh, Amna Hawash. So she'll be speaking with us soon. Thank you very much. Our very own principal, Al Taf Hussein, and of course Kay, who will be sharing some of his, his insights shortly. So, um, Ramadan is a really important event in the college calendar with around 50% of our students and a significant number of our staff observing and celebrating this event. I have no personal experience of Ramadan. I'm going to be perfectly straight with you. I myself uh, was raised Catholic. And in the Catholic faith, we have something called Lent. Um, I feel very inferior because in Lent, we have to give up one thing for four weeks. Uh, so I don't underestimate the commitment and the endeavour that it must take to fast for up to 14 hours a day for four weeks. All of this, of course, whilst you are continuing to study or to work and to revise and get ready for those all important end of year or end of course exams. So my total respect to all of you. Um, as I say, I'm going to say a few words, so I'm going to finish there. But to share some of his insights of combining Ramadan and fasting with work and study, I'd like to introduce our principal, Al Taf Hussein. Over to Al Taf. Thank you. Hey guys, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. We have some audience participation here. So hands up those who started fasting at the age of 12. Okay, more than I thought, actually. Okay, and then I'm assuming anyone younger than 12. I'm sure you're not breaking the law there. I'm sure there's some safeguarding issues there. Anyone younger than 10? Wow, okay, they, they are really, okay, okay. No one younger than six. Thank God for that. Okay, fine, okay. So, the point I'm making is, is that the many of you of veterans of this. When I speak to some of our staff, they kind of think, oh my God, I said they haven't done this before. But guess what? Many of them done this for a long, long time. So already, you know what the rules are. You want to identify what the tips are to get through the best way for the next month. And I think it's not just about diet, is it? I think sort of Ian talked about diet. You've already got your plans. Now, some of you might be the ones who wake up at three o'clock in the morning and you're killing the small sin, the bakuri and the bratin, all this sort of stuff, and you wonder why you're thirsty for the rest of the day. That might be option one. That's my son, by the way. He kills a small sin, and then he doesn't drink any water, and then he complains about being thirsty all day. And I'm sure the doctor will be talking about that at some point. I'm a lot sadder. I do the pasta. I do that, the kind of the protein milkshake. I have a very scientific approach in terms of managing the whole thing. The downside for me is, I'm a little bit perturbed about actually starting Rosé during Easter. A lot of my family are over the moon. I think, Kay, you said you, you were quite happy about it. Do you know why I'm not? It's because kick off, you know, four o'clock, after you do all the bits and pieces, my family go to bed and they probably don't wake up until about, they do the Mars and they get up at 2.30 and they go back to sleep. Muggins here, I'm awake from six o'clock in the morning and I can't sleep. I don't nap, I don't do anything. So I like distraction. Some of you might be in the same category as me. The point I'm trying to make is you will know what will work best with you. I'm so privileged to have the doctor here. She will give you some of the tips. Water, diet, carbs, protein. Am I kind of saying the right things yet? Yeah, brilliant, okay. And then what you will do is, like my three kids, a third of you will ignore completely the advice that we're giving you and the other two thirds will take some of it. That's entirely up to you. However, there's so much more to Ramzan than just about abstaining from food or drink, isn't there? 
And that's what I love telling my non-Muslim friends about. But actually, it's so much more. It's about after your inner kind of purity, in terms of after you being calm. Now is the moment for you to actually operate the three C's, okay? Don't complain, don't criticize, don't compare. Not easy, but that is part of the process. I'm sure that's what Kay will be talking about. It's so much more than after abstaining from food and drink. Also, a huge amount of money is raised for charity. The good news is many of you raise money for charity throughout the whole year. You don't want to just wait for this time of the year either. And so much more. <coughs> so, the reason why we wanted to be here, because we've got to get off here, but we wanted to be here just to say a few things. Firstly, how proud we are of you. And I'm not just saying that, genuinely, you've got so much things to be happening. Of course, Rosie is going to coincide with the weather probably getting nicer. Just when you've got to start revising, just when you've got to start doing all the important stuff, but you will get through. Because after you are loot and mate, that's what you are used to doing. You are used to actually overcoming obstacles all the time and you will do that over the next five weeks, six weeks, in anticipation of your trial exams and your formal exams. That is exactly what being a good Muslim is all about, but that is what it's all about, being a good member of this Lutheran community. So, thank you, and anticipation of how you are going to act, how you are going to behave. Those moments over the next month, as and when you don't have a great relationship with maybe a cousin, or maybe with your brother or your sister or some friend, these are the moments for you to maybe look at that and think, am I really sweating the small stuff? Do I need to be a bit bigger? Do I need to use this time to approach someone who I haven't spoken to because you will feel better about it? Okay, so thank you for being here. So many of you here, I'm always amazed. It's got some magical power when he gets all of you guys to be here on a Friday afternoon. Is that bribery, blackmail? I don't know which one is it. Is it better? Okay. That's, that's perfect for them, which is, that's exactly my strategy with my kids as well. But seriously, thank you. Can I say also thank you to, to the doctor, actually, to Kay and to Ali, all of you for actually being just brilliant members of the college community. Okay, I am John. Can I hand it back over to over to you? Key guy here. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you so much for coming here and one of the presence. And, and, and again, some of the messages that you do need to know from a college perspective. We know it's not an easy time. Yeah. And we do really, really look in high admiration people who fast and do what they have to do. As always, look, as a college, we will do whatever we can to support our students in any type of scenario that they find themselves in. If you need help at any point and you need to reach out, talk to your progress career coaches, talk to your teachers, come and find us if you need to. We're always here to support you, especially on the Come in and go two weeks off so we can enjoy it the best as we can then. But I will allow for our time at the end of the week. Our very, very busy people to have a lovely time. Good luck to your next appointments. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, guys, have a good Easter as well. Bye. Thanks, man. Okay, let's, gonna, let's see if this works. Yeah. All right, so what we're going to attempt to do today, inshallah, let me put this down. Um, so we're going to begin. All right. So firstly, thank you all for coming. And we did receive your questions. So inshallah, I would deal with them in the presentation. And if we didn't do it in the presentation, we'd try and do it in the Q&A. If you still have questions, then there'll be opportunity, inshallah, not only to ask questions to Elif and I, but of course to our uh, guest, Dr. Ahmad Tawash, who really has taken time out to be here today and at the climate and all that. We really, really do appreciate it. So do remember the people who are supporting us in the college, even of us, especially over the coming weeks, because she didn't have to be here and she didn't hesitate. I didn't need to bribe her. I didn't need to say anything. I didn't need to like, be waiting outside the house in the bush at my time. And because she came here on her own accord. So it's our pleasure. Thank you so much, Doctor. This is what we have to do. Yes, welcome to Six So, uh, just to begin with, very important, I want to talk to you guys uh, about the concept of intention that we have. Now, Elif, inshallah, will go into a bit more detail about that regarding some specifics around Ramadan. Uh, but before I do that, also I want to relate to the hadith which is found in the Sahih Muslim and Sahih Bukhari. Uh, I'll read it straight from it so we can understand what we're talking about. And this is narrated on the authority of Abu Hurairah, 
the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, said, Verily Allah Almighty has caravans of angels who have no other work but to follow gatherings of remembrance. When they find such gatherings in which there is remembrance, they sit with them and some of them surround the others with their wings until the space between them and the heavens is covered. When they disperse, they ascend to the heavens and Allah Almighty asks them, although he knows better than them, for where have you come? They say, we came from your servants on earth who were glorifying you, declaring your greatness and oneness, praising you and asking from you. Allah says, what do they ask from you? They say they ask for your paradise. Allah says, have they seen my paradise? They say, no. Allah says, what if they were to see my paradise? They say, they seek your protection. Allah says, from what do they seek my protection? They say, from your hellfire, our Lord. Allah says, have they seen my hellfire? They say, no. Allah says, what if they were to see my hellfire? They say, they ask for your forgiveness. Allah says, I will pardon them, give them what they request, and grant them protection. They say, our Lord, there is one among them, a simple servant who happened to pass by and sit there alongside them. Allah says, I will also grant him pardon for whoever sits with these fellows will not suffer misery. And the reason why I say that is to highlight the idea that we are here together for a purpose, for a reason. And that is to try and understand Ramadan, and that is to grow closer to Allah, and that is, inshallah, to be within His remembrance. So if we have the correct intention for this gathering, inshallah, the hadith could apply to us, where the angels descend and the mercy of Allah surrounds us. Even those students who we harassed in the corridor and just pushed into here, the hadith said, the one who was walking by. And now here they are. So alhamdulillah, here we are. With that intention, we can begin what we're going to discuss and understand firstly the concept of intention. Now I say this very seriously. We know already from Sahih Bukhari, from this religion, that verily actions are based on intentions. We know that. But the thing I really want to highlight with intention is this understanding in Islam that success comes from Allah, we do our bit. Now when Ramadan begins, and this is some of the questions that were asked of us. One of them was, uh, you know, blessed were asked, how can I deal with trying to be perfect in Ramadan? No one is asking you to be perfect in Ramadan. Right? This isn't, if that was the case, none of us would. But what's very important is that we understand that we are still students, that we are studying in college, we have our college responsibilities. Here's, here's something you need to recognize. When our students signed up to college and came here, you signed a learning agreement, you entered into a promise with this college. And from the perspective that I'll be speaking, which is predominantly from a Hanafi perspective, so I'll get that out there now. Um, a promise, keeping a promise is worth it is necessary. So we have promised this college that we will abide by our work, we will come on time, we will do what we are required. And also we have our exams coming up, and our exams are very, very important for us. I want to say immediately, don't feel as though you have to choose between fulfilling Ramadan in the best of your capability, i.e. the ideas that you have. I want to read half of the Quran every three days and all of these things, but I have an assignment due, or I have an exam due. Because I'm going to tell you a very, very important hadith in a minute to try and explain the mercy of this religion to everyone. I'll begin, inshallah, the messenger, peace and blessings be upon him, said, Verily, the world only has four kinds of people. There is one whom Allah has granted wealth and knowledge. So he fears his Lord in them, upholds family ties, and fulfills the rights of Allah over him. He is in the best position. There is one who Allah has granted knowledge without wealth. He has a sincere intention. And he says, if I had wealth, I would have acted like this person. If that is his intention, he would have the same good will as the other. The hadith goes long, but that's what I would highlight. This is in Pirmidhi, this is Sahih. What's important here to understand is that there is a person who has nothing but is receiving the same reward as the person that Allah gave wealth to. That person with wealth is spending on charity, assisting the people around him. Yet, how is it the person with nothing can receive the same reward? And you heard that, because it is with sincere intention. My point is this, before we begin, inshallah, looking at specific details, the point is this. You may genuinely, sincerely want to increase your ritual worship in Ramadan, and that is a good thing. But 
sometimes you might say, instead of reciting Quran for two hours, I might have to limit it for half an hour and study for an hour and a half. What takes place here is number one, you are fulfilling that which is wajib, necessary. So you are gaining that reward. Number two, if you sincerely intended that, and if you didn't have your exam, and if you didn't have your studies, you would have done that Quran. Inshallah, you get the reward for all that. The hadith is clear. So I wanted to stress that very now. I don't want anyone to be conflicted about what I have to do in Ramadan. If you had that sincere intention, inshallah, the reward will come. Right, but the key here is sincere. Don't be like, Ya Rabb, if I had the time, I'd read the Quran every day. And then he gives you the time and you watch Netflix. Slightly different conversation. All right, so please, edit will inshallah go further into details of intention in Ramadan. But that is something I really wanted to stress. Don't feel that worship is limited to ritual worship. It's not. For example, honoring and respecting our parents is not considered ritual worship, but it's something which is an obligation upon each and every Muslim. The reward for which is massive and the failure to do so is massively condemned. Right? So many things that we do with the correct intention are worship. And when in this month of Ramadan, you guys are in a position where you very well may have exams. Your exams are wajib upon you because they are things that will open doors for you and take you and you commit to the promise to uphold your education. I'm getting that out there. And let's begin with an incredibly crass session on fiqh. Is that there? No, we're not. Okay, so let's begin with the fiqh. Um, now, I, as I said, I want to make this very clear. I'll be approaching this predominantly from a Hanafi perspective. And also, do not think that's it, you've studied the fiqh class, that's not the case. Where I'm aware of an alternative opinion, I may put that forward. Where I'm not, I'm not. And, I, and I, I'm being very clear, I do not know everything. So I can only tell you, I know these are headlines for fasting in Ramadan, so that our fast is accepted, inshallah. Now, what is Ramadan? Why do Muslims fast? Quite simply, here you go. Chapter 2, verse 183. All you who believe, fasting is prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those before you, so that you may be mindful of God. So part of what we are doing is about mindfulness of Allah, knowing Him and being close to Him and having Him in our hearts and minds. But it has been prescribed to us, it is given to us from Allah. It is what we do. And if inshallah will explain further about the benefits of when we are fasting. Now, with fasting, I want to let you know not everybody has to fast. We have this concept of medical exemptions, right? There are other exemptions too. So for example, if there is a medical exemption, speak to your GP, alhamdulillah, she is here today. So you may have some questions around fasting and what takes place in fasting, which I cannot answer from a medical perspective, but inshallah, I'll go uh, Secondly, uh, menses, you do not fast if you are on menses. It does require a makeup fast, we put that up off. You would have to fast with that, with the intention of Allah when the time comes. But nobody is in a state of sin or not having or not being able to fast in that. Pregnant or breastfeeding, if legitimate harm takes place, so from what I'm aware in the Hanafi school, it doesn't automatically exempt you. Uh, it requires a lot, but hopefully, no of us I'm aware of, take your time, people. Don't, don't, don't. And also traveling. If you're a traveler, and what that means is a different thing, it becomes optional whether you fast, you don't have to. And if you chose not to, it's a legal exemption. So what is the fight to fast? Um, an intention. You must have an intention to fast. Now, I'll try to explain this in two ways. The best thing to do is to have an intention every night before you fast and renew that intention every day. And it doesn't need to be much. It can be in your heart. You don't need to say it out loud. It doesn't have to be in Arabic. It can be any language you want it to be. You can just say, oh Allah, I intend to fast for you, for your sake this day of Ramadan. Now, that's the Hanafi opinion, that you need to renew your intention every day. Also, waking up for suhoor would count as in fulfilling your intention. In the Hanafi school, it's very difficult not to have an intention, unless you're totally zombie not branded. Although I would say this in the Maliki school, I'm aware of an opinion from Imam Malik and others that if you intended at the beginning of Ramadan to fast the entirety of Ramadan, that would satisfy the intention. So I'm putting that out there. But it's better if you can renew your intention. Secondly, moon sighting, that's a tricky one. Uh, and thirdly, avoid the nullifiers. Now, moon sighting, somebody did ask, is a very, very, very quick version of this. Moon sighting takes place in two ways, which is why you get differences, and they're both legitimate differences. It doesn't matter. It's not, oh, I started Monday, you started Tuesday, how dare you, ha, ha, ha. That doesn't work like that. Here it is in two principles. Number one, it's something that we call a global moon sighting. So whoever announces first, that's one position in Islam. 
that happens to be the dominant position in the Hanifi school. The other position is locally in Saudi. So what takes place locally, and that happens to be the dominant position in the Shafi, for example. Now, uh, when I say global, I mean a country where a Sharia judge can validate the two witnesses. So we're not going to get that necessarily in the UK, but generally sometimes Morocco is used, some other African countries are used. I'll say this, there is not a legal requirement for Saudi Arabia to announce where Ramadan is and for you to follow that. that, that that's not part of the fiqh. The fiqh is either whoever announces first or your local, depending on your that. Personally, whoever announces first, I'll go with it just in case. And if I'm wrong, inshallah, it's enough of ask for me, but you don't have to do that. So you can follow the opinions that you are aware of. Now the nullifiers, uh, quickly I'll go through them. Now what that means is if you did any of these, you have a problem. And I'll try and discuss that. We've given you the dua for fasting as well, uh, which are there. They're not required for you to do, but they're good things for you to do. We'll upload all of this for you, inshallah, on the source so you can access it. Now, nullifiers fall under two categories. Something that we refer to as a break, or I should say, potentially a lawful break. All it requires is God also. So if something happened to you on that day, you would be required to make that pass up. That's as simple as it goes. Secondly, it's something that we refer to as a serious break, or occasionally referred to as an unlawful break, which I hope nobody here will do, because if you did that, it's quite serious, and it results in not only qada, but something called kafara. Now, uh, kafara is never easy to talk about, because kafara basically means the following. So qada, you always go the fast. So imagine on Tuesday, somebody decided to unlawfully break their fast. They owe that fast for that Tuesday, and they have to do that at some point in their life. But the penalty that they pay, the kafara, the expiation, is 60 consecutive days of fasting, in addition to the one that they missed. So if there's an unlawful break, your penalty is 60 consecutive fasts, which is not an easy thing to do. One kafara will suffice, inshallah, for any unlawful break. So if you have 10 unlawful breaks, you owe 10 qada, but one kafara will suffice. But inshallah, we won't need to do any of that. So uh, what would break it and lead to kafara in the Hanafi school, the following, eating and drinking unintentionally, uh, sorry, intentionally, unlawfully. And I'll explain what that means. Taking medicine unnecessarily, and finally sexual relations. I am aware that in some other schools that might not be the case, it might only apply to sexual relations, but I don't know and I can't speak on that. I can only talk to you about Hanafi perspective. So if you eat and drink unlawfully, take medicine that you don't need, and have sex, and by the way, that will also include masturbation in some ways, um, then kafara, which is a problem. Aside from that, these are the things, and like I said, they will be on the thing for you, on source for you to look at. Break, qada only these things. So I'm not going to go through all of them, some of them. So if this happened, you owe the fast from a Hanifi perspective. Accidentally eating or breaking a fast. Now, uh, I want to explain something very quickly here, because there's a, there's a difference within the Hanifi school and other places. If you were fasting and you autopilot without even thinking, picked up a glass of water and drank it, and that lovely, put the water down, said, oh my God, I was fasting, carry on fasting. Right? And, and that's universally agreed upon, that's based on a hadith where that's regarded as Rahma of Allah, mercy of Allah. Keep fasting, Allah gave you mercy. So that doesn't mean what I'm talking about. Now, accidentally eating will fall from the Hanafi school under what we call swallowing water during the week. Now, what happens here in the Hanafi school, you know you're fasting, right? You consciously are aware that you're fasting. And you go and make wudu, and then accidentally you swallow the water, and you go, oh man. In the Hanafi school, you owe that fast. But, in some of the other schools, you would that would still fall under the category of an accident. Right? So it's up to you how you do that. I, I, you know, do what you need to do. Swallowing blood, blood from within the mouth, depending on how much it is. Uh, breaking the fast due to sickness. Now this is one I want to pause on. You are perfectly allowed to do that with zero sin whatsoever. If you are ill for whatever reason, you owe that fast. But there is nothing wrong about that. So if it's, now, I, I, look, I mean genuinely, right? Don't just say, oh, go ahead, uh, you know, and go break a fast, but that's not the case. But if you're actually ill, um, and I don't know what that means for you, and maybe that's 
much, we'll talk more about that. But that is a thing that it's okay. You owe that to us. This is not a religion that is trying to make your life incredibly difficult. It is. But do, do bear that in mind. If you get sick, if you get ill, that's all. You just owe that to Smoking breaks your fast. I don't believe the hype that it's not good when you're fasting is not. You can validate your fast, right? So, inshallah, you don't smoke. Vaping is also the same, yeah? So don't try and find a loophole. So if you break the fast, don't do it. Swallowing food from within the mouth, which is more than the size of a chickpea. Induced vomiting of more than a mouthful. Uh, actually, in the Hanafi school, the opinion is taking an inhaler will break your fast. So you owe that fast. But I've heard of opinions from other scholars, some contemporary scholars, and possibly some other madahib, that it wouldn't. Consult your scholar on that. And take it from the Hanafi perspective. Now, you, you, you would not be sinful. As I'll tell you that now. In if you needed to take your inhaler, and you took your inhaler, that's okay, you're all uh, Ejaculation due to kissing or touching. So that doesn't have to actually be penetration. But, uh, to so things that do not break the fast very quickly. Uh, all right. They do not break the fast. Like I said, eating something while absent minded. So autopilot, you forgot oh, and you ate from your drink, you'll find caramels. Eye drops, no, water entries, no, no, no. Smoke or dust, not taken deliberately. So if you're walking past and someone blows smoke in your face, passive smoking, and you, uh, uh, you're okay, carry on fasting. Uh, I would say taking anything through the veins or the muscles, like an injection or a vaccine, will not invalidate your fast. A blood test will not invalidate your fast. Although it said if you could avoid it while you're fasting, you avoid it. But if you didn't, the opportunity to avoid it. Take a blood test, it's fine, it won't break your fast. Um, swallowing something left in the mouth which is less than the size of a chickpea. So for example, you finish your support and you run off and there's like a little bit of rice in your mouth and you accidentally swallow it, that's what you carry on. Tasting food without swallowing it, there are details there, which I'm not really going to go into now. But avoid that if you can. Uh, experiencing a wet dream during the night or the day. So gentlemen, if that were to occur, you are obliged to take your whistle, so you do need your purification bath as, as a gentleman. But it doesn't invalidate you to fast whatsoever, to carry fast. A showering will not invalidate your fast. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes things that people wanted to talk to me, place an impression. Um, yeah, okay. Some clarification. Suhoor is not a condition of fasting. And by that I mean the pre dawn meal when you wake up. It's not a condition of fasting. So if you didn't have suhoor, you're still fasting. You're just going to be quite hungry one day. It is an emphasized sunnah. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said there is a blessing in it. So of course I would encourage it and say do it where possible. But if for whatever reason you didn't, your fast is bad. Okay? Carry on. Tarawih is not an obligation. It is a good thing to do once again. Now, it doesn't have to be prayed in the mosque. You can pray at home. Do consider that, especially if you've got studies going on, especially if infection rates go skyrocketing again and there's risk in your household for vulnerable people. Maybe consider what you're doing. Right? So, uh, but just, it's not an obligation. You can brush your teeth within the high school, however, uh, it would be disliked very much. Because there's also a hadith of the Prophet, he explains it, I believe it's Bukhari, I think, when Allah says the sweetest smell to Allah smells like musk, is the breath of fasting place. Now, let me clarify something. We are not in a Muslim country where the entire society that we are in shuts down and everyone's fasting. I get that. So for some people who are mingling with other people, whether it's work or colleagues or anything else, you might be a bit uncomfortable with it. My mouth going to cause offense or whatever. And that's a choice you have to make. You can still brush your teeth in fasting, but before support, I brush my teeth. Like after iftar, I brush my teeth. You can use a siwa to sleep at any time. Uh, that, it's not an issue. You can still practice good oral hygiene. Right? In and of itself, it won't break your fast, but that's a careful to swallow something accidentally or whatever. I've said what I have to say about that. Somebody asked me about this. Look, the fast begins when fajr begins. It's got nothing really to do with that adhan. When the time is the time, stop. Right? When Fajr enters, stop. Not when Fajr finishes. That would be an invalid fast. 
right? And somebody said, hey, what about if the adhan is being recited in the Hanafi school, you stop. Somebody said, oh, but can you continue? I, I, I don't know. In the Hanafi school, the answer to that question is no. And it's not dependent on the adhan. The adhan could be 10 minutes before, 20 minutes after. It doesn't matter. But the time is the time, the time is the time. You stop. Uh, swearing doesn't break your fast. But please don't do it. Haram thing to do. Fighting doesn't break your fast, but please don't do it. You know, on this self defense. Uh, lying doesn't break your fast, but don't do that. Bleeding doesn't break your fast, but don't do that. Wearing makeup doesn't break your fast. Not praying doesn't break your fast. Your fast is your fast. However, I will say uh, there's two things that happen when you fast. Right? Number one, you're removing the sin from missing an obligation. Number two, you're gaining reward for fulfilling your obligation. So if somebody fasts, they've removed, inshallah, the sin of not fasting. But then your reward, which could be a little bit or a massive amount, is going to be affected by the quality of the fast. And that's where Hennif could talk more about that. But I just need you to understand that these two things are occurring at the same time. So somebody who, for example, who fasts but does not pray, inshallah, the fast is bad. But the level of reward, right, uh, certainly the sin element would be there if they're missing an obligatory prayer without any valid reason. Um, so what that will do on the spiritual dimension, because do, do remember, as Muslims we believe in physical and what we call the metaphysical, beyond that which we can see and hear and touch. The ruh is a physical thing. The angel is a metaphysical thing. The angels around us are metaphysical. We have these ideas in Islam. So there's other things that are going on on a spiritual level that we need to consider when it comes to fasting. And inshallah, Elif will talk more about that, and I'm going to get there very quickly. Uh, on that point, let me see. Forgive me, that was a very like, brief crash course in it. Um, and some people on the fiqh of fasting did put forward some medical questions, which I can't ask. So, inshallah, people will watch and be able to tackle this. Um, some other questions that I've seen, can I go to have them? Yes. So, inshallah, we'll deal with some of that. If you have any immediate questions, just on fiqh of what we've heard here, feel free, put your hands up, and we'll quickly do a rapid, rapid fire if I can answer our will. If you don't have any questions, hey. Going once, going twice, and I've just been up one. Like I said, don't take what you just heard as an excuse not to study the fiqh of fasting. It's complicated. I didn't even talk about recommended actions. I didn't talk about that which is disliked. I just gave you the headlines about that which would break your fast and that which won't break your fast. And some of the questions that kids can't you know, put in. So if you've never heard about this discussion before, inshallah that's a good opening for you to then go and study further with qualified people and inshallah you can gain a lot of knowledge around that. So uh, I will hand over inshallah to Elif, uh, who will take you know, arguably a very important part of this discussion. You should just stay here and hold it for me. Yeah. Get him trained, trained up. It's not part of my obligation. So I welcome everyone. I hope you're well. Uh, so how did that we're here? Um, to be honest, I've been bullied into this, and uh, you don't know the arguments we had this week about this. And I've got toothache too, but I'll see Dr. Arnold later. Right? 
Alhamdulillah, we're here. So basically, um, okay, so Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Sayyid Muhammad, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim. So, I want to start off with this um, hadith, this beautiful hadith, uh, narrated by uh, Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu, who said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever believes in Allah and the last day, then let him honor his guest. And whoever believes in Allah on the last day, then let him say what is good or remain silent. So, just thinking about then this idea of a guest, okay? Because that's what we can relate to, I hope. What do you not do when, when a guest comes to your house or a guest is about to come? Tidy up, if it did, definitely. What else? Huh? Make food, beautiful, what else? How's your behaviour when the guest comes? And your parents are peering at you, making sure you don't make them move wrong. Good behaviour? Yeah. Nice behaviour, nice, nice manners, very polite, yeah? yeah? Likewise, likewise. We're at the beginning of, 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 of a moment where we've got this guest coming. And this guest, alhamdulillah, this Ramadan is coming. And we're lucky that we are here, inshallah if it's tomorrow, alhamdulillah, or Sunday. We're lucky that we're here because there are people that aren't here, to, they haven't made it to this point, and Allah have mercy on them. But we are here. And this guest is coming, and then it will go, and hopefully we'll see some more. But we don't know. So being prepared and getting our, our hearts ready, I know we've got like just a few hours potentially to do that, but our heart and our mind ready for that. Yeah? And do you like my nice, that's, that's class, isn't it? Yeah? So, but you know, being careful what we're saying, what we're hearing, what we're seeing. So, preparing for this guest. And gratefulness. So, tying in with that. As I said, we're, we're here, others are not. And we're in this beautiful gathering on a Friday at Jummah, which is really blessed. Really, it is. And there's more than 40 people here as well. And there's a, there's a saying about, you know, if you have gatherings and there's like, 40, 40 people in there. In there somewhere is someone who's who's like a who's like a friend of God and like and one of our teachers, Allah bless him, who passed away, he he would always say that when you have a gathering like this, get in the middle of it and make dua. Make dua. Because as Kay mentioned, uh, no people the hadith of the Prophet no people gather to remember Allah Almighty, but that the angels surround them cover them with mercy, send tranquility upon them, and mention them to Allah among those near to him. And we're in that. And internally, we can be making all the sorts of blessed du'as that, that we can, inshallah. And so, asking. Asking who? Asking the one who, who has everything. So we can ask Allah Ta'ala, we can say, you know, oh Allah, give us a good one. I don't know about you, but I've had ones that are not so good, and I have ones that were, it's like, I thought I was like the most spiritual person on earth. Obviously, to do did, but still. But asking Allah for, for, for the best in this. Because this, this can be a time of great spiritual openings. Um, I know people, and you probably know people, that really, in Ramadan, they change. And I don't mean just for a month. That something happened to them, they felt something, they saw something, they changed their ways, and then, oh well, sure, they became something else. And this is the beauty of this month. And in the old days, like the old times, the righteous people would like get ready six months before Ramadan would come. Six months before they became ready. Obviously, different level type of people, but that's how serious they took it. Because it is a time where amazing things can happen, really. And in this kind of like, like theme of thinking about asking from him, also thinking about who are we going to be making dua for as well. Maybe like having a list or thinking about who is it that really needs help at the moment. Family, friends, other people across the world that we know are going through difficulties, whatever it is, and making dua for them. Because the dua, the dua is powerful. And if you're throwing fasting in that as well, and you throw in a good intention, Sure, that's going to be something beautiful and accepted. And if you're making dua for someone who is absent 
as well. You've got this beautiful hadith of the Prophet who said, the du'a of a Muslim for his brother, and whenever in Arabic we've got brother, it means, it means brother and sister combined. So it's not like just the males or anything like that. So the du'a of a Muslim for his brother in his absence is responded to. There is an angel in front of him that has been assigned to him. And every time he makes a du'a for his brother with good, the angel assigned him says, Amin. And to you the same. Yeah? And to you the same. So, Kay talked a little bit about the ficky stuff of intentions and things, but as you all know, everything is based on intentions, yeah? So intending big, even if we can't reach that, intending big. So here are some ideas, you probably are familiar with some of them, and I'm not gonna go through every single one. What we'll do is we'll put these PowerPoints on source, so if, you're, if you've got an interest, you want to have a look again, or we'll copy anything, it'll be there in But anyway, we should intend to be in the state that Allah and His Messenger love for us to be. We should seek to attain Allah's pleasure, and to strengthen our following of the Messenger of Allah so that we attain his companionship. And we should intend that a new door is open to us in understanding the Quran and acting according to it. Because of course, this is the month of the Quran, right? This is the month when Allah chose this to be, this beautiful book to be revealed. And we should intend to avoid the inward things that nullify just as we do the outer things. So he, it's okay to talk about the outer things, like you eat this, you do that, you put this up your nose, this in your ear, yeah, all fine. But there are inward things as well, which we'll touch on in a moment, for sure. And Imam Ghazali on the lesson talked about three types of fast. You had the type that the fast, number one, which was the ordinary people. So stopping eating and drinking, right? Then you had the fast of the elite. So when you're protecting your ears, your eyes, your tongue, your arms, legs, what have you, from doing anything wrong. And then you have this like, like this next level one, which is like for whoever it's for, the elite of the elite, the spiritual superheroes. And even if we can't get there, it's good to know about it. And maybe we can say, Ya Allah, you know my state, and I can't get there, but you know, I'd like to be included in that lot. And who knows, maybe he can include you in that. But the heart to be focused only on Allah. So imagine you go through your day where you're just, your mind, your heart is just on Allah. Even though you're with the people, you're saying, Salaam Alaikum for how are you doing? You know, Salaam Alaikum for how are you But really, actually, actually, your mind, your heart doesn't move from him. So externally you're with the people, but inside, mm -mm, you're with him. And some virtues of Ramadan, some of you were asking about this in the questions, bless you. It's the master of the months. Alhamdulillah, we've reached this far. Inshallah, we don't like die tonight or something, God forbid, yeah. I mean, we get there tomorrow or Sunday, whatever it is. But this is the month of the Quran when it was first revealed. Iqra bismi rabbika ladhi khalaq. So read in the name of your Lord who created. This is when he tells our blessed prophets, as of the first time, you know, read in the name of your Lord, which Lord? Who, the Lord who created, created us. Yeah, and it goes on as well. So read, and your Lord is most, what's Akram? Us, our students, don't embarrass me now. Akram? Kareem? Generous. generous. Akram, most generous. Most generous. And of course, Layla to Qadr is in this, and we'll get, that, get mention that in just a moment, inshallah. Uh, the Prophet Sassan told us, whoever observes fast during the month of Ramadan out of sincere faith and hoping to attain Allah's rewards, then all of his past sins will be forgiven. Past sins will be forgiven, like just from this beautiful month. He said, anyone who fasts one day for Allah's sake, Allah will keep his face away from the hellfire for a distance covered by a journey of 70 years. And we ask Allah, let us be that. Let us be those people. And when Ramadan comes, the gates of the garden are opened and the gates of the fire are closed and the devils are chained up. 
the devils are chained up. So this is a beautiful opportunity. Because what, what kind of goes wrong, or we find ourselves getting into, it's not because there's some like, nasty police out there or something like, up to no good. No. It's more maybe personal, something that we're doing. So a beautiful opportunity, inshallah. Layla al Qadr, I have to mention this. So better than how much? A thousand months. A thousand months, years and years and years. And making tensions as well. Oh Allah, please let us catch that. Let us be like a little, like, just to catch that, inshallah. And uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him, it's quite sweet. I, I, I love this one. Um, the Prophet, peace be upon him, was, was speaking to the companions about a man from Banu Israel who, who, who fought in the way of Allah for a thousand months. Yeah? He's doing jihad, he's doing the, the good stuff for, for a thousand months, which is over 83 years. And um, the companions got a little bit sad. They got sad. Because they're thinking, well, we're only going to live to whatever age. We're not going to live that long. We've got short lives. And Allah Almighty granted us, or granted them, Layla al Qadr. So this has not been given to any other prophet people before. So it's a beautiful gift. Akram, remember we said Allah's Akram? It's a beautiful gift. Huh? And Sayyidah Aisha anha, asked the Prophet if, if I reach that, because these were people of, they could tell, right? They had a, they, they knew, really, sometimes, when that was, because of their spiritual level and so forth. She said, what should I, what should I say if I, if I know that it's that day, or that night? The Prophet said, say, oh Allah, truly you are all pardoning, and you love to pardon, so pardon us. Allahumma innaka afuun tuhibbul ahu wa ta'afu anna. Yeah? Okay, so being practical, so nice and spiritual stuff, yeah? Hearty stuff, with heads in the clouds kind of thing, but we have to be practical. How do we be practical? Getting organised. So Hamza, you've got two weeks now at least, yeah? Where you can kind of organise your time a little bit as you wish, as, as little bit as you need to. You haven't got to be at such and such a lesson at such and such a time, alhamdulillah. So getting organised, planning like a master. Uh, thinking about how am I going to organise my sleep, my rest, my food, etc, etc. Thinking about your holiday, two weeks, and also when you come back to college. What are your heavy days? What are your light days? Are you going to be able to fit in a nap if you're exhausted? If you're going to Tallinn and it's taking hours, um, and you get back late and you're shattered the next day. Is there a way of you having a nap? Is there a way you maybe like, whatever it is, whatever works individually for you, when is your revision time gonna be? Yeah. How are you gonna do that? Are you gonna work better in the mornings, after Sahur, after Fajr, or in the evenings after Iftar? What works for you? Think about it, give it some thought, inshallah. And if you need help, we're here as well. And I think on Source there is a, there is a Ramadan planner as well, which you can have. Um, practical steps, everyone is different, but baby steps, small steps. Um, try and think as well about the Qur'an. How might you bring in something of the Qur'an into your, into your month? Yeah, and, and I'm not talking to, mashallah, the, the beautiful um, the Fafaz of this, of this, this college, mashallah, that know the Qur'an by heart. But, but even then they might be going over it to remind themselves. But, you know, even, you know, there are Muslims that don't know some of the surahs, the basic surahs, we think. Maybe you might be learning like one verse. You might be reciting the surah ikhlas three times every night. And according to the hadith, what is that? What is that? Surah ikhlas three times. Equivalent to the whole Quran. The whole Quran. Surah ikhlas. If you don't know it, you could, intelligent students that you are, actually, you could learn it. So whatever you can do, think. Might be that you want to give charity one pound a day. If that's too much, 50p a day. One of our dear teachers, Allah Bess, used to say, um, give sugar even to ants. So even if you've got nothing else, you just got some sugar, give it to ants, that's charity, that's sadaqah. Yeah? There might be some old person down your road who you know is lonely. No one comes to see them, no one comes to visit them. You see them struggling with their bags of shopping all by themselves. You might go knock on their door, give them something. You might go and give someone a smile, whatever it is. A small deed can have a huge heavy effect. You know the story of the lady who gave the water to the dog? Yeah, that story. You know, just that beautiful act of her 
giving her dog water. Allah forgives her for anything or everything that she's done. So there are many paths, many things you can do. Last ideas. Dhikr. You know what dhikr is? Remembrance. Keeping in a state of remembrance, if you can. Not harming others. Now this is the days of like, oh my God, TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat, Allah. I don't even know how to begin with those. But that can also mean not harming other people. It might mean also be careful what we're posting. Be careful what we are putting into social media. Being very careful with that. Being grateful. Because Allah tells us in the Quran, if you are grateful, I will certainly give you more. So being thankful, being grateful. Alhamdulillah, we're not in Yemen. You know? One in five children dying of starvation. We're not in some of these other places in the world where they've got nothing. Alhamdulillah, these have got clothes on our back. We might have something in our tummy. A million, alhamdulillah, for that. And Allah make it easy for them. And remember, they're going to go to us. But alhamdulillah for that. Help your family members. If you have a mum, if, if Allah has blessed you with a mum still, then help her. Because you know what? A lot of the, a lot of, not always, but a lot of the effort, work, hard times comes on the mum. Mom is cooking. If it's anything like I've seen, like there are ladies like back in, like in Turkey, their, their Ramadan is just cooking and cleaning, cooking and cleaning, cooking and cleaning. Poor ladies, but you know, mashallah, they'll get a huge reward for that. But help them. Mom, go on, go and spend a little bit longer than five minutes on your prayer. I'll do the washing up. I'll clean. I'll put the stuff out on the table. Whatever is help, 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 inshallah. Um, Itikaf, taking that time just to be like by yourself in a place, in a garden, under a tree, where it, where it is, in your, in your bedroom, thinking about Almighty, asking for his forgiveness, whatever it is. Studies of worship as well, like Kay mentioned. Spread love, spread salams. When you're walking down the street, especially the sisters, mashallah, because you, you kind of are very identifiable if you're wearing a scarf as well. You know, smile. Smile at people, hold the door open, be conscious of how you are. Yeah. People can be changed. People used to, in the prophets or something, would see the prophets are walking and they would just be in awe, like how he had that state. He would put his hand on the orphan's head when other people maybe wouldn't bother so much with orphans. He would put his hand, he would stroke the head of the orphan. Yeah, these little beautiful special things, but there are secrets in these things. And Hadith, the prophets was most generous of people in Ramadan. Um, abandon lies. So basically, do what you can. You know this. You know the hadith probably about backbiting. Being very careful as well. That's a really hard one, but be careful with that as well. That's nice. Mashallah. See, mashallah, technical skills. <laughs> A reminder to make lots of du'a, give charity, recite the Quran, do what you can, don't waste your time. We've got time, don't waste it, don't waste it, don't waste it. Help people, but don't be just thinking, I'm going to watch this film. I'm going to do that outside, not, not in this month if you can, really. Um, so do what you can, inshallah. And lastly, last um, uh, uh, verse that I'll leave you with, Allah Ta'ala says, When my servants ask you of me, Indeed, I am near. I respond to the prayer of the supplicant when he calls upon me. So let them respond to me and believe in me that they may be guided. All right, Allah is close. He tells us, I am near. Nearer to us than our what? Joking the brain. He's there. He knows your difficulties, your sadness, our, our ups and downs. He knows it all. What does he say? Call on him. And you know that the saying is, well, if you come to him walking, he comes to you, running. That's our Lord. That's our generous Lord. Just call on him. And that's the little dua to leave you with. Allah, forgive me if I, if I went over. Um, you've got the, literally the nice juicy thing now to get to, 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 um, to listen to Shalom with Dr. Amna. Okay, Jazakallah Khair. Uh, it just dawned on me when I'm going to try to do this. Yeah, that's what will happen. Hand on the quickly, then I'll just hand over straight away. Mr. 
doesn't. So I'm going to elaborate, inshallah, after Dr. Amr Hawash with some of your questions, some of the points that were raised, and that, inshallah, there's a few things I want to add. But I'm going to hand over to our, our esteemed guest to talk about what she would like to talk about, and of course, field any questions that you have for her. So hang on, let me just set this up. Why 
why does food matter? There we go. That's what it will be like. I will point to you. Because we eat it. <laughs> yes. it's really important because actually when we're saying we're fasting and we're not eating and drinking most of us spend most of the day thinking about what we're eating and drinking and what we're going to be eating and drinking or the fact that we're so so hungry or so so thirsty when actually we probably on a normal day wouldn't have eaten and drunk much anyway um, so it is really important because what we tend to do is then say oh my god I've not eaten the entire day I therefore have to have this massive meal at the end of the day and people make more of an effort to kind of get together as communities, as families, which is all great, but it's how do you do that in a healthy way. Um, so, um, why is food related to your health? Anyone know any conditions that are related to kind of a poor diet or a bad diet or affected by our diet? Diabetes. Diabetes, excellent, thank you. Who was that so I don't, hope we don't pick on you again? Diabetes, anything else? Cholesterol. Cholesterol, yeah, exactly. Rickets. Rickets, what a scientific answer, well done. Rickets, yeah. So multiple kind of deficiencies, anything else? Anemia. Anemia, Anemia yeah. All of those things can be affected by diet. What about, has anyone either personally or known someone in their family that has wanted to go on a diet, that has wanted to lose weight? Yeah, all of those things. Um, also things like cardiovascular disease, so heart disease that can lead to like really serious things like heart attacks and strokes that don't just happen in old people. It can happen at any age, depending on your risk factors. And unfortunately, um, some of our communities are more at risk of having either risk factors for things like cardiovascular disease or diabetes. Um, some of you might have heard or experienced it yourself or have seen family members that have been had really severe impacts from COVID for example simply because of your background it your risk was just much much higher if you come from a black or minority ethnic background so already we are at risk so it is really really important that we take this opportunity which by the way um, according to my phone as people were talking is tomorrow the Ramadan Mubarak to everyone. Okay. Yes, apparently. Um, so we only have a few hours really to be thinking about um, what we're going to be doing in terms of our food um, for the next month. Sorry, that was like the most anticlimactic, like. Ramadan Mubarak! Hi, Mubarak. Good, I mean, you can say that back. No? There we go. Thank you. So, um, and we were talking about intention before. So the Prophet um, there's lots of different um, hadiths that talk about kind of blessings that people don't appreciate, and it's usually around health and leisure or free time. And Islam does tell us that one of the um, good health is one of the greatest blessings. And if you know you've been unwell recently, if you've had COVID, you know I lost my voice for over two weeks, and something as simple as just kind of you know, answering the phone, you know, calling for somebody, anything I just, I couldn't do. And you appreciate, you know, something that you completely take for granted, just being able to speak. So your health is really, really important. So what kind of foods do we normally eat in Ramadan? This thing, people can tell me, you can answer that. That's not a medical question. That's not a hard question. What do you normally eat in Ramadan? You're not even looking at me to see that I'm pointing at you. Yes. What do you normally eat in Ramadan? Yeah, what kind of traditional food? Roses, mm -hmm. pakoras. Anyone else eat anything different? Biryani. Biryani. One of the guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't, don't come around. You, you. Yeah. What do you eat in Ramadan? Fruits. Fruits. Excellent. You don't even need to be here. Well done, you. Carry on. Anything else? Dates. Dates. Uh huh. Yeah. Soups. These these all seem like side dishes. What are the main dishes? What are people chips. eating? Chicken and chips. Uh huh. Curry. Curry. Yeah. 
Abscess are usually kind of rice and kind of something that's cooked with lots of oil and is heavy and tastes really nice, lots of oil and butter. What about dessert? Oh, everyone's on Twitter. Everyone's suddenly talking about food. Baklava. Baklava. That, that, was, that was actually the one thing that I was waiting for somebody to say. Um, so basically, lots of high sugar, high carbohydrate, high oil, high fat food. So what should we be eating? Does anyone know? Oh, baklava was in the picture. Like, it wasn't that hard. It was in the picture. Does anyone know what the eat well plate is? Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. You're nodding really? in the green jacket. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know? Yeah. Hey, well, <laughs> go on, tell me what the eat well plate is. Um, is it like um, you have your carbs and your fruit and your protein and Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And the easiest way to think about it is that it is a very colourful plate. And this is what your plate should look like. This is what you're aiming for. Not obviously all of those things all at once, but bits from each, each part. So you want the colorful things. You want the fruit, the vegetables, the things that kind of retain a lot of water for when you're really, really thirsty. You want to have a little bit of dairy, some carbs, and some, um, some protein. And if you're having something like samosas and then a curry, that's not covering this eat well plate, yeah? So you want to start thinking about what else can I put, how, you know, I need to decrease the amount of rice that I'm having to make room for something else. And in general, the easiest way to think about it is the more colorful your plate is, the um, healthier it will be. I'm trying to think really quickly if there's something that's really unhealthy but really colorful. Not sugary sweets. As long as it's not sugary sweets, then you're good. Fudge. So fudge would fudge I think I would put in the same category as samosas where it's just one colour. So anything that's kind of a bland one colour, you do not want a plate of. You can have it in a little part of your plate, but you want the rest of the plate to be filled with um, lots of colourful things. And essentially, you want to tr be trying to avoid foods that don't have any nutritional benefit. Um, you want to avoid having lots and lots of things to eat, excessive eating, and also under eating. So you ha will have fasted all day. We've just heard, you know, all the support from your college about the fact that you will be having exams. You'll have to revise. You'll have to come in. You'll have to wake up early. Your sleep might be disrupted. Um, so you do need to make sure that you have that energy on board. Please do try and wake up before. Please do try and um, have something nutritious for if you are. Um, if, if maybe you can start having a look at the things that you're eating. So, you know, um, Alec mentioned about helping your mum or helping whoever that's making food. If it's not you, then, you know, go into the kitchen and see what is being made. Have a look at it. How much nutritional benefit is this, um, is this giving me? What else could I add to it? Oh, I'm going to keep doing that. It's going to really annoy me. So what kind of foods do we want to avoid? And by that I don't mean never have another samosa, okay? It means have it in moderation. Because actually, what I've realized, so how often do people have samosas on a day-to-day -day basis? How many samosas have you guys ate today? You've had five samosas today? <laughs> Who's had five samosas today? <laughs> I feel like it was you. Um, okay, but in general, we don't tend to eat that many samosas. So, um, you know, my family are Egyptian. Um, I come from an Arab background. We don't have samosas in our diet. In Ramadan, my mum used to make tons of samosas and it would be like three o'clock in the morning. She sat frying these samosas. Why? Why is this Ramadan food? It should not be a Ramadan food, right? Or, you know, guys that spend all year going to the gym and, you know, with their protein shakes and balanced diets and things like that. Some of the guys are looking at each other and smiling. And then it all goes out of the window for Ramadan. That should not happen, yeah? Little, small, consistent changes that you can make throughout the year. And it really can give you a lot of confidence that actually you can make those changes. So if, for example, there's something that you say, oh, I can't do without. So what's one thing, you, guys, you girls here, what's one thing that you're like, I can't stop eating this thing? 
chocolate, okay? But if you can manage without chocolate for 14, we've done 16, we've done 18 hours of fasting throughout the day, how much chocolate are you really eating between, you know, 8 p.m. and 1 o'clock in the morning when you wake up? I'm hoping you're not going to say like three kilos. It's not going to be that much, and it's probably not going to be as much as you would have on a normal day. So actually, when you start to have a think about what food should I be avoiding or what food should I be cutting down on, and recognising that actually you've managed to go through most of Ramadan with cutting out those foods, it can give you that confidence to continue those habits throughout the year. Because I think one thing that hasn't maybe been touched on is that this is not just about the month of Ramadan. This is not about reading as much Quran as you can in Ramadan. It can be, of course, there's lots of blessings, lots of rewards, but actually it's how do you build that habit when you're getting yourself used to being in that situation for four whole weeks and then taking it forward and giving yourself the confidence that actually I've made this positive change, I would like to continue it throughout the year. So, what about components of food? So if we're not going to be able to change all of our food, what little things within food? Using less oil. Thank you. Less oil, that's on my list. What else? Less salt. Less salt. No salt. Adding salad. Yeah. Someone said something on that side. No? If we're thinking about salt, um, salt, what's the other thing? Sugar. Mm -hmm. There's one more thing that there's been quite a lot, and we're, you know, millennial generation, lots of people have been really focusing on eating this, oh, and eating less of this food group. Carbs, yes, but it's not food group. No. Meat. meat! Chicken and chips also. Oh. So, meat, I'm going to talk about as well. So, what I wanted to do is instead of people just telling you all the time you should cut down on salt, you should cut down on sugar, why do you need to cut down on these things? And maybe if, you, you know, if you're thinking about actually this is related to this really bad health condition that I either don't want to get or I'm at risk of getting or I know people that have them, then maybe that's a different way of um, approaching the way you think about it. So, salt, does anyone know any conditions that are related to salt? Why, why are we so hot on reducing salt? Blood pressure has a massive effect on your blood pressure, which as we've said can have an effect of, you know, putting you at risk of heart disease, heart attack, stroke. Anything else? No? So it can also be um, related to headaches, people who eat lots of salt. Um, can have lots of headaches. It can make you feel very, very thirsty. And if you're eating, like I was saying earlier, um, if you're eating really salty food and you're not drinking enough water um, at school, you'll feel very thirsty. You're more likely to get a headache, especially if you're working and revising. What's the recommended amount of salt? Anyone know? Oh, so close less than six in an adult. So you want to be aiming for less than six grams of salt. So there's a really good app for the you know, gym people, um, MyFitnessPal, which will actually allow you to input everything that you're eating and drinking, and it will tell you the components of it. So it will tell you how much salt. It will tell you that actually you're now nearing the end of your salt content. Oh, now you've crossed over. And it might just be a good idea to just pick up something, you know, if you come to eat it and see how much salt in it, and you'll really be surprised. There is a lot of salt in food. There's also a lot of sugar. And what's sugar related to? Diabetes. Diabetes. Diabetes is the big one. What about this? What's this? Butter. Yeah. Ghee, butter, oil. Someone mentioned about cholesterol. I'm going to move. Can you hear me if I'm not talking through the mic? No. Yeah. Who said no? <laughs> I'm very loud. Now that my voice is back, I'm very loud. Do you actually need me to use it? Because otherwise I can move it out. I do need you to use it. Oh, because of the recording. Okay. There we go. I'm going to hold it and feel like I'm on a talk show and be famous. Um, oh, now I have to watch what I say. Um, so, what the cholesterol. What can it also contribute to? Gastritis, so you can feel really heavy, that heartburn, yeah? Cardiovascular disease. 
cardiovascular disease. That's really the answer for most of the things that I'm asking you today. Um, yeah, and it can also increase your bad cholesterol. So there's, it's not about cutting all fat out of your diet, it's the bad fats out of your diet. And meat. So a lot of people, red meat specifically is what I'm talking about here, a lot of people, the only thing that they think about is, oh well my meat is halal and that's all that that is. I'm not going to go into it today, but there's a concept of um, having tiny of food as well. So having you think about where your food is coming from, how it's been slaughtered, what, where the animals have been looked after, you know, the conditions and that kind of thing. And actually, is it healthy and is it processed? All of those things. Um, and actually, you know, if you're chicken and chips, which might taste very nice, I love chicken and chips, um, but if it's costing you a pound, it's probably not going to be very tiny, which probably means it's not going to be very good for you either. So having a look about how much red meat you're eating, um, maybe cutting that down. There is no need to have red meat or any meat every single day of the week. You can have a bit of a vegetarian diet, introduce more of that colour, even a bit of a vegan diet. Not necessarily all the time, but you know, one day a week if you're not having, you know, dairy or meat or you know, fish, that's okay. You will survive, I promise. I know some people who cannot not have a meal without um, meat. You will survive if you just have vegetables, I promise you. And you'll probably feel a lot better for it. So, how do we initiate change? So now we've thought about this, we have literally about five hours um, before we have to start thinking about what we're having for support. What would be the barriers if you're thinking about, actually, I want to make this change in this Ramadan? What would stop you? Bad habits, yeah, the fact that actually you think, well, I've been doing this, you know, for the past 18 years, how can I change? Your mum is cooking, okay, yeah. What else? Any other barriers? Addiction. Addiction, addiction is a really good answer. Who said addiction? Well done. So when you're saying addiction, what, you, what do you mean? Like you might crave sugar. Yeah. And people really, really do. You know, it's not just about smoking. You know, people smoke. A lot of people manage to stop smoking during the fasting hours. And inshallah, if you do smoke, this helps you give up. But, you know, as Kay said, it does invalidate your fast. So people can manage that time. They can manage without the chocolate. You can manage without the sugar. I love to eat sugar, and actually, I'm a very kind of emotional person when it comes to food. So if I'm really, hungry, you know, really angry or really upset, I'm like reaching around, where's the food? But actually, when you're fasting, you can't do that. So it makes you think about, well, how else can I manage all of these things? How else can I manage my addictive behaviours? Actually, am I really that addicted to something? Coffee, morning coffee. My husband will have about 12 cups of coffee a day. And then it will come to Ramadan, and he'll just stop. And then the day after Ramadan, he'd be like, no, I need a coffee. Well, you don't need a coffee because you've just spent a month without 12 cups of coffee a day. But the main barriers are exactly as you said, you know, the other people around you. And that's why it's so good to have a community like this where you know other people that are fasting, um, you know, that can support you, that can talk you through it. And you can just have a discussion about, you know, the changes that you've made. So cultural traditions, maybe not everyone in your family will want to make these changes. It might be just you that's saying, actually, you know, I don't want samosas every day. It might not be you cooking. So how can you get around that? And it's already given you a, an answer. If it's your mum cooking, saying, no, I, the only thing I will cook is samosas. You can make your own food. You're all adults, right? Yes, yes, well done. That was a confident yes. Yes, you can make a meal. You can contribute to a meal. What about giving yourself enough time? Again, it was mentioned earlier, you know, having a plan, maybe sit for 10, 15 minutes when you go home after this and just plan out your day a little bit. You know, when am I going to think about what I'm eating? When am I going to plan it? Do I need to meal prep anything? If you can meal prep to go to the gym, you can meal prep for Ramadan. Yeah? And how do I, and if we can't do any of those things and actually it is too difficult you know your mum is the only person that's cooking what kind of things can you do to change the foods that you're already eating so say you know your family say we eat chicken every day that's just what we do you put your hand up your mom. you can advise your mum of course so please any knowledge that 
I decided to come in a gentle, nice, you know, polite, caring way, of course. Um, but also, um, please, any kind of advice and, you know, knowledge that you get, it is incumbent on us to share that knowledge. You know, go home, speak to your family. They will be the ones that can support you. Um, in all of these things, but also just little changes. So if you're going to eat chicken, instead of it being fried chicken and chips, maybe grilled chicken, maybe using a healthier type of oil, maybe using things like yogurt, all of those things. Does anyone know what this is? Quinoa. Quinoa, yes. <laughs> Who's had, who has eaten this before? About two, three, four, five, pe six people. Well done in a whole room. So this is actually quite tasty and there are lots of different um, different types of kind of quinoa or grains or beans and things that you can have instead of your rice. There is nothing that says, there is no rule book that says you must have this type of curry with basmati rice. It, it does, that does not exist. You can have different things. And, ooh, there we go. So, just think about some small changes. So one or two things that you want to go away from here, maybe on your way home, you can think of just one or two small things that you want to change in your diet. Share them with someone, either share them with your friends, somebody that was here or somebody that wasn't here, or your family. And just, just try and think about it, that this is not just, okay, four weeks so that I have more energy, so that you know, I lose a little bit of weight, whatever it is, but actually as a long-term change, because actually this is part of Islam, we have to look after our health, we have to be very mindful of everything that we're doing, and that includes the food that we're eating. Oh, okay, there's a little bit about the impact of fasting, so I'm happy to send these um, slides to Kay, um, and you can have a look at them um, on source, was it source? Um, but just have a think about what your routine will be. So somebody was asking questions about um, physical activity and how much could I do. Again, that is a very, um, very personal question. If you are the kind of person that actually usually goes to the gym for an hour and a half every morning and then after college you go for a half an hour run, then yes, you will be able to do probably, you know, quite a bit of exercise um, through Ramadan. But if you're the kind of person who has actually, you know, walking from here to here gets really, really tired, this is not the time for you to start. Yeah? You need to be mindful of actually the fact that this will be a strain in your body. The days are getting longer. You will feel thirsty. You have your obligations, you know, for more important things like your studies, like your exams that, you know, will impact your future, all of those things. And actually keeping the fast is a priority. So keep it light. Most people try and do, you know, a little bit of physical exercise um, just before they break their fast. So more towards maghrib time, if you have the energy, so that you know that actually, you know, something is coming. You will be able to eat soon. You will be able to rehydrate. But it depends on what you're used to. Try and not overload your body, which I mentioned earlier about um, not overeating. So don't let your mum put everything on the table so that. Uh, just, Concentrating on your mum now, I'm sure she's lovely and she's doing it all out of the you know goodness of her heart. May Allah reward her, inshallah. But you know, take a little bit of time. If your body has fasted for 14, 16 hours, don't overload it with you know three meals worth plus you know your samosas plus ooh, plus water plus you know mango juice and all of those things that most people do not drink during the day during the year, but all comes out in Ramadan. Um, you know, break your fast with something, you know, rehydrate with water, an odd number of dates, follow the sunnah, go and pray maghrib, maybe have something like a soup, then come back, have a look at what your, um, what your plate is, make sure it's colourful, find something, have another break, pray your tarawih, make sure that you're taking water with you, you know, maybe have something, uh, have more dates, you know, something with good sugars in it, fruit, honey, yoghurt, make sure that you've left enough space for your, um, left enough time for your sleep. What time are you going to wake up? Are you going to um, you know, pray, um, pray for to have another couple of hours nap? And then you know, you'll have enough energy for the day. As Alif said, you know, do you have time for a nap in the middle of the day? Have foods that will provide you with energy and hydration throughout the day. So this is just a bit of a, um, 
you know, a breakdown if people want to kind of follow that. So wholesome food, so that non-processed food, balance, a moderate size. You don't want to, you know, it's so difficult to pray tarawih or do any kind of ibadah, which is the intention of Ramadan, if you're just so full with that heartburn, with, you know, a really heavy curry. And that's not to say, by the way, don't have a curry throughout Ramadan. Yes, do have it, but a smaller portion at a different time, not every day. Plenty of fluids and try and have your sahur as late as possible. So try and avoid kind of breaking your fast, eating, 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 going to tarawih, coming back, eating, and then an hour later having something and saying, oh, well, I just won't, won't wake up for sahur. Do try and wake up and give your body that time to process the food. Hydration, so 60% of your body is made up of water. It can impact your performance, concentration, headaches and things. So who's got one of those big TikTok bottles? Oh, well done. I actually did not manage to get one, I was very sad. But my sister has one and they're all over TikTok where people are carrying these massive bottles of water. Fill one of those up and just drink it between um, your uh, maghrib and before you go to sleep. So a couple of litres, you want to have whatever you would normally have, but spread out throughout the day, but not in, uh, throughout post Maghrib. But you don't want it to be where you're drinking jugs of water, because actually, again, that will make you feel unwell. It will make you feel bloated. It will stop you drinking, you know, in a couple of hours. The best thing is to have a big bottle, so 500 ml bottle, one litre, two litre bottle, because you'll be having um, fluids through other foods. So that's why it's important when, you know, the fruit and vegetables, things like cucumbers will have lots of fluid in them anyway. You know, making sure that you're not filling up with you know, lots of your mango juice, which is just sugar rather than providing the hydration. And ah, we have some recipes. Um, so I've put on there, so this is the um, British Islamic Medical Association um, tag. Um, I also gave a talk on, or a show on Inspire FM yesterday about preparing for Ramadan. Um, that's online on Facebook and on their, um, I've stopped managing to talk now, uh, on their website. And next Thursday, inshallah, we'll be talking about sleep and your sleep routine and how to get the most out of Ramadan and beyond by organizing um, your sleep and kind of your sleep-wake cycle. Um, a lot of people, especially coming up to um, exams, would stay up during the night and do things that really are not very helpful um, for their long-term health. So we'll be talking about that, inshallah, Ramadan is a good place to start in terms of thinking about how you're sleeping. And takeaway recipes. So there's some recipe ideas. So if you really, really do still want the samosas, somebody said you could bake them. I mean, you can try and put them in an air fryer, maybe with brushed with oil. I don't think we can go from deep frying all the way to baked in one step. But the air fryer really tastes exactly the same. Try and kind of homemade salad dressings, grilling food or fish or chicken. Um, you know, again, somebody said baked gulab jamun. I don't even know how that would work. But it is an option. You could try it and maybe, you know, you could become insta famous with your recipes. Uh, fruit salad. Fruit salad is another really good one, but just please avoid all the syrups and things that come with it um, in Ramadan. I'm going to get this right. Yes. So, some things that you could think about eating for sahur. So, eggs are good, you know, preparing things like um, granola, porridge, uh, ful, if anyone knows what that is, which is um, broad beans, um, an Egyptian dish, um, yogurt, fruftar, things that are baked, grilled. Uh, boiled, lots of um, soups, lots of water, lots of vegetables and fruit. Oh, and then it stops. Then it stops. Questions? Yes. There was a question about um, tablets, which I think we kind of covered, but um, essentially, one, speak to your doctor, because it may be that you can just as easily take your tablet at night or you know at support time um, but anything that goes basically anything that you are swallowing breaks your fast so if you are needing to take tablets if you are told you need antibiotics three times a day you will not be able to fast on those three times a day because it is important for you to take this antibiotic but 
you know, all doctors have an awareness of Ramadan, have an awareness of what um, changes and adaptations we can make. So actually, if somebody came to me with a chest infection that needed antibiotics, there are options for kind of once a day antibiotics or twice a day antibiotics that you could have. But obviously, again, that depends on you, on if it's suitable for you, if, or if you're on other tablets, or, you know, if you have any allergies or things like that. The other thing that I wanted to mention is um, when you were talking about um, being on your period, essentially, for all the sisters on this side, not so much the men, but also actually more for the men who have sisters, who have mothers, who have aunts, who may not be fasting, and actually allowing them to eat. There is no point in, in you know, Allah give, has given us that rahmah that actually there are certain days where you can't help it, you will not be able to fast. Don't fast. The amount of people that then don't eat because they're like, oh, but my family's around. Oh, I can't have a drink. Oh, I have to rush here and just eat under the table. No, you don't have to eat under the table. You can have some water and you should feel empowered to do that because actually there is a reason why. You might be needing to take tablets. You might feel more dehydrated. You might have more of a headache. That's okay. Make sure if you're not fasting, then you truly are not fasting. And you can still put in place a lot of these things that we talked about, about you know what kind of foods you're eating. Do you need to have you know three meals a day plus four snacks? Probably not. You can do your Ramadan in a different way, with just with that intention that actually, if you were able to fast, these are the things that you would be doing. Any other questions? This is the only question that I felt I didn't answer in the presentation. So you lot wanted to know about gym. Is that clear now? Is it better to go gym whilst they're fasting or after lunch? It, it really depends. So it really depends on you, your day, what else you're going to be doing. If actually we have such a small window of time and you know, you're breaking your fast, you're having some time for some ibadah, you're going to Tarawih, you have college in the morning, where are you going to go to the gym? Some people do, some people go to the gym at like midnight, that's fine. But if you're not going to be able to do that and it will affect everything else, then just before fasting. But like I said, listen to your body, you know how much exercise, you know how much strain you can put your body under. And if you've never exercised before, start off with a walk. A gentle walk, you know, 20 minutes, you don't have to get out of breath. Just before iftar, you know, clear your clear your head, clear the air physically. Um, you know, it will still be light, obviously. Um, and you know, maybe just do some dua. You know, think about your day, reflect, plan for the next day, plan your event or whatever it is. Just take that time for yourself because that is so so important as well. Um, and then break your fast, inshallah. So again, it really depends because some, you know, my whole family caught COVID at the same time over Christmas. Most of them were absolutely fine. Within four days, they were negative. I was in bed for three weeks. So if you're unwell, you shouldn't fast. If you're well, you're not on any tablets. You're not in a group that have been offered, you know, tablets. If you've got COVID, then you can if you can. But also, if you start your fast and then you feel unwell because you've got COVID or anything else, then break your fast, take the tablets, have some water, whatever it is. So, my question is let's say you get a lot of food and you can taste a little bit of it, but that break your fast. That is a thick question. Uh, it depends on the colour of your saliva when it comes through. Right? So, if it changes it to a gravity different colour and you swallow it. If you weren't aware, then you weren't aware. What I would say is, if you're somebody who gets nosebleeds um, frequently, and this may be an issue for you, then just you need to find out from your scholars what the figures, what the guidelines are, and then if it happens, it happens. We, there's not much that we can do really about preventing nosebleeds um, if they're just going to happen and stop by themselves. No, if you have a health condition and you can't fast, how can you repay it? Are you, is your health condition permanent or is it temporary? Um, permanent, you pay fidya, which is equivalent to about four pound a day for somebody to have a meal. And there are websites that can do that for you or a mosque that can do that for you. If it's a permanent medical exemption. Yes. 
And again, if you have a medical condition that is permanent, that you're not able to fast, please do not fast. And please do feel free to eat and drink as you normally would, as is in keeping with whatever your condition needs. Yeah. depending on how urgent it is, if it needs to be done in Ramadan, then you might be told actually you should not fast and you need to be having, you know, this medicine, a lot of surgeries or procedures, you need to have medicine before it to prepare you for that procedure, so then you wouldn't be able to fast. There is no sin on you, yeah, make it up, that's it. Any other questions? Is it unhealthy to only eat during the dark? Um, as in, and not have support? Yeah, as in, when you have support, you just have water. I would say yes, from the point of view that actually, you know, that energy has to take you through the entire day. That hydration needs to take you through that entire day. Hmm? What if it does take you through the day? I mean, some people, we, as a, you know, as a people worldwide, eat much, 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 much more than we ever did in the past. And, you know, there's hadith about how much you should eat and how much space, you know, you should leave in your stomach, all of those things. So, we can survive on a lot less than we're eating, but then you would have to want to make sure that what you are eating at um, iftar is really healthy, giving you that energy, you know, longer lasting, long release uh, carbs and things like that. There's no one rule fits all. You know, you don't have to say, there's, you have to eat 200 calories at this time and 500 somewhere else. Any other questions? Yeah. Is it permissible to have flavored drinks in between Zawi and Fred? Yeah. yeah I mean, permiss course. permissibility is absolutely fine. The question then is, what are they flavored with and how? Yeah. So if it's just some syrupy thing, which is just... Yeah, syrupy like things we you want to avoid, Kind of all of the Rubicon type cartons, try to avoid those. Um, things, carbonated things that might make you feel uncomfortable or might contribute to you getting kind of gastritis, that kind of thing you want to try and avoid. But things like squash or if you have juice that you water down, things like that. Or, you know, things that you just want a little bit of flavour, that's fine. The most important thing is that you're taking in the water. Any other questions? I, I'm aware we have massively run over, um, but ah, uh, one last question. So the question is if you have a permanent condition and you're on medication which constantly um, clashes with fasting times, does that mean you'll never be able to fast? So I would ask your own GP about that. Like I said, it might be that you can change the timing of some, some of your medication. It might be that actually if you know you're on this long-term medication, there might be an alternative that maybe a month or so before Ramadan, you can switch to it and see if actually you, you know, you'll stabilize on that in time for Ramadan. So Ramadan doesn't just happen upon us, you know, we don't wake up and go, oh my God, it's Ramadan, didn't realize it was coming. We knew it was coming, right? This is kind of a bit too late in the day because it's like five hours to go, but for future, for even, you know, book an appointment tomorrow with your, tomorrow's Saturday. Your GP might be open Saturday, I work on Saturdays. Um, book an appointment with your GP, and even if you can't pass that first week, it might be that something can be done for the second week, for the third week, for future Ramadans, whatever it is. But it's not an absolute yes or no. And I think this that's really important to kind of get out there to our um, for our communities. Um, that you know, people might have parents, grandparents that are on medication and they're they're like, oh, I'm on this medication, 
I can't fast at all. That might be the case and they might not feel able to, that's fine. Um, but also other people who say, you know, I've always fasted, I don't care if I'm on this medication, I can't not fast. You might not be able to fast and it might not be safe for you and therefore you shouldn't fast this time, this week, this, you know, this Ramadan, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you won't ever be able to fast again. And, and on that, you will possibly still get the reward for fasting yeah. if your intention was sincere. Yeah. Alright, JazakAllah khair. I hope that was useful. We'll share the slides with you guys. Um, but please, anyone, if anyone has any questions, um, I'm at Dr. Amna GP, A M N A, uh, on like Twitter and Instagram. Especially if anyone is interested in um, any kind of healthcare profession, medicine, dentistry, nursing, physicians associates, blah, blah, blah. We have given talks here before, we do lots of kind of talks and mentoring in the community. So please do contact me and I'm happy to help you out. Thank you so much. Round of applause. Very quickly before we end it, we give us the overrunning. So yeah, Ramadan the bar may be a blessed one, inshallah. There's two things that uh, were asked a lot of and I want to highlight and stress. There is nothing more beloved to Allah than our obligations. Alright? So people want to start doing much more than they can do in Ramadan. If it is at the expense of your obligations, this is a problem. And why I mentioned this from a hadith in Bukhari. So look, if you don't pray, now's a good time to attempt. Alright? If you don't help your parents, now's a good time to start. If you don't show compassion to your neighbor, now's a good time to start. And these are things that we need to be doing. If you're behind on your work, now's a good time to catch up. When it comes to doing more in Ramadan, a few things people ask. I want to highlight this hadith in Ibn Majah Sahih. The Prophet, peace be upon him, told us, take up good deeds only as much as you are able. For the best deeds are those done regularly, even if they are a few. But you might want to worship more, little bit, little bit. Now somebody asked how about the Quran in Ramadan, well, we can divide it into 30. Eight Jews is a 30th of the Quran. You can see what that is and then plan your day juice by juice. If that's too much for you, then don't do it. Don't put yourself in a circumstance. And I, I take this very seriously. When you like imposed in your own mind, I read a juice a day, and then by day four, you're saying in your heart, ah, oh, man, I wish I didn't have to read Quran tonight. That's a problem, right? That's one of the ways that we can go misguided. So do that which is little that you're comfortable with, but do it with excellence, inshallah, little by little. So at the bare minimum, we recommend to all our students at least read Surah Ikhlas three times a day. And if that's explained why, at least give a little bit of charity every day, inshallah. Small baby steps and then build on it. Add an extra two nothing in your prayer in the evening, inshallah. Little bit. And if two is five, you're like, yeah, alhamdulillah, that was good. Add another two. If that's five, alhamdulillah, add another two. Bit by bit, consistency, that's important. And also do remember, Save energy in the tank for your schoolwork, for your studies, that's important. That is wajib upon you, it is important for your future, inshallah. That is considered worship, have the right intention for it. I wanted to talk more about Layla Qadr, but we don't have the time. I'll put something on source. That is when the Quran was revealed. Treat each day like it's Layla Qadr. Our scholars have said, you have to search for it in 30 days. We'd search for it if it was in a year. So take each day like it's Layla Qadr. And then inshallah we'll catch it. So those extra two bits of good deeds that we want to do, do it every day, inshallah, and then we'll get to it, little bit by little bit. Somebody said, how do I connect more with the Quran? Read the English as well. Or a language that you can understand. Of course, the Arabic is important, do it. And those of you who are struggling to read the Arabic, but in a process where you are learning to read the Arabic, continue in that circumstance, you're getting double the reward, and that's in the hadith, narrated by Sayyidah Aisha. So the person who is struggling to read Quran will get double reward, providing they're on a journey of learning. Right? That's important to understand. Read it in English, reflect on it. If you want to tap into what we call tafsir, find some videos of somebody doing tafsir or look at some works of tafsir that explain a verse or two. There's an awful lot alhamdulillah, that takes place virtually in Ramadan. We will send out links to organizations that offer free courses that you can jump on on demand and online and live 
get involved. Some of them are really fascinating courses, none of which you need to pay for, many of which you can do in your own time. I, my students said, but also in our period over when it's menses, what do we do? Because it feels as though all of a sudden I'm left out. No, you're not. Of course you're not. Worship is not just limited to reading the Quran or praying. Of course not. You can take the opportunity in that time to reflect on creation. You can, and I do advise, to work on spiritual aspects of this religion. Go and get a book from Imam al Ghazali. I recommend two books. Right? You can order from Amazon. If you hit Prime, you'll probably get it tomorrow. Right? One of them is called The Remembrance of Death and the Afterlife from Imam al Ghazali. We put links up on source. Genuinely, it's a crushing read. Like when you read it, you will sit like that because you're like, oh my God. But that's a good thing. And secondly, his book uh, on patience and thankfulness gives a perspective that we don't see. You can take your time with that book and read it. It's quite easy to process and digest. Another book which is good, which is short, Imam al-Haddad, Book of Assistance. And then you can get the PDF, you can get it online. I think we've got it on source somewhere. You can go and read it little bit by little bit. Just, you can do these things. So don't ever think, oh, because uh, it's my menses time, Ramadan is excluded from me. Not at all. The gates of mercy are open for everybody all the time. So you can still be in the remembrance of God in any fashion. Helping your parents, helping your siblings, helping everybody. And being in dhikr. If you don't have a tasbih, go and get one. Right? And you can continue doing that. There are some adhkar that we have that we can put on there for you to go and read throughout Ramadan. The excellent thing that I do highlight uh, is the book of Istighfar put down from Hassan al Basri. We put the PDF point source again, small tiny little dua that you can just read and recite over and over again and it shows you the perspective he had. He's one of our pious predecessors of those early generations. Really, again, impactful stuff when you read it. So yeah, if you're going to engage with the Quran, try and take another 10 minutes, even if that means read less, but then go back and read it in Arabic and then uh, read it in English and then try and just reflect on what you read. That doesn't mean you create Islamic law from reading it. We don't do that. Just think of some of the ideas that Allah puts down. The Quran is a profound and deep book. And you, you, you get that the more you study and the more you look into it. Um, it's all I can think of immediately off the top of my head from the questions that we have. If anybody does have anything that they're burning to us, please do. We would populate source. We've got a Ramadan planner PDF you can jump on. And it's really helpful. Mashallah shows the dua of the day. And it gives you good encouragement and things that you should be doing and maybe what surah to read and it's interesting it'll be on source for you to look at we're also putting on there a free pdf ebook the author gave us permission which is legitimately meals in ramadan written from a medical perspective for young Muslims. they said this normally 12 pounds but they said people can have it for free that'll be on source so go and check that and if you do make any of those meals take a picture share it on your twitter tag everyone in let us know what it is and how it went down. So you have these sources and resources available to you. We'll populate source, go into Faith Matters, you'll find a follow up on Ramadan. We'll fill it up, inshallah, with everything that we can. If you have specific questions, just email, get in touch. If there's a specific medical question, you can try and tag Dr. Ahmed, good luck with that. But if it's like something, I'm, I'm experiencing heart palpitations, what should I do? Yeah, go for something, right? So, should be awake. Right. Right. So that's it. And also, just a uh, final thing. Look, uh, Laylat al-Qadr has been mentioned many times. Our religious studies students should know the story of that. I just very briefly want to tell you that, that took place in the year 610 CE. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, was 40 years old. And for those who don't know, he went up into the mountain. And then he was met by a man. And this started. He did not know who that man was. And the man said to him a single word. Iqra'a. Which could mean read or it could mean recite. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, who was illiterate, did not know how to read and write, responded by saying, I do not know how to read. The person said once again, Iqra. Prophet, peace be upon him, I do not know how to read. This continued another time, and then this person grabbed him and squeezed him and squeezed him. And then for the first time in human history, Five verses of the Quran were revealed. The first five verses of Surah Al Araq, chapter 96. And I'll read them for you in English because you have to understand this is no accident. Allah could have chosen anything in the Quran, He chose these five.
to give to a community who had forgotten their existence of a God. And those five verses are the following. Read in the name of your Lord who created. He created mankind or humankind from a clinging cloth. Read. Your Lord is most generous, who taught by means of the pen, who taught humankind what he did not know. And one of the reasons I'm highlighting this now, as something to reflect on, is because we are college students. One of the miracles and blessings and favors that Allah gave us, which is found in these verses, Allah describes himself as generous. Why? Because he taught. So firstly, he created me. He's generous. And that not only did he create me, he gave me what we call the ability to learn, to understand. Allah gave us knowledge. We have to think what that means as students who are studying. We are not like small animals walking around. Our mind can unlock mysteries of the universe. This requires thanks to Allah. He gave us something so precious. And that's a proof in Islam as his existence. The fact that we can learn, we can understand, we can discover. This is generosity. So inshallah, when that night comes and we keep talking about it, try and remember that. That is the five verses that forever changed human civilization. And from that moment on, Islam was revealed to humanity. So bless you lot for coming. We really appreciate you taking time out on the last Juma before the advent of Ramadan, especially there. I know it seems sunny out there and you want to go and play. I suggest you go to Tesco's and live in Landy and stock up on water, colourful food, vegetables and other things. And help your parents, inshallah, in this one. You have two weeks, do the best you can. Right, inshallah. And when you come back, forgive us for our shortcomings if you salam me in the corridor and I just walk into a wall. Inshallah, make dua for us. So, yeah, if you need anything, shout us. Bless you all for coming. Ramadan Mubarak to you and your families. May it be a beautiful time for us all. And Jazakallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.